happening here. So today's session is, is I, you know, actually, I, you know, it's basic to intermediate, you know, back up restore is something that I don't think every developer thinks about. I think it's kind of one of these operational things that's a requirement in many organizations. Uh, it's, you know, people who are thinking more about, you know, uh, DR and resilience and, and really compliance often think about these things. So that's kind of why I gave it a little bit more of an intermediate uh, kind of uh, uh, moniker here, but, but they, they, this is kind of some feature stuff. Um, but then again, you know, what we're doing is, is, is fairly complex, you know, distributed systems always add, add a little complexity. So, you know, what are your requirements? Um, you know, what are you looking to do? What are your challenges around backup and restore? Um, you know, there's lots of stuff we can talk about here. You know, I figure the session should be about 15 to, oh gosh, a half hour, 45 minutes, if there's great questions. Um, but but we do hope it's uh, uh, valuable to everybody today. So um, with that, let's come off, uh, let's come on video. Chris and Michael, are you there? Awesome. Hi, Chris. Hey, Jim. Hey, Michael, how are you, buddy? Um, cool. Welcome. Welcome, guys. Uh, it's been so long since I've seen you both. You guys, I'm just back from a two-week holiday, and it's just kind of, you know, I'm getting my brain re-kicked in here. Um, but, Michael, tell me again, what is it that you do here at Cockroach Labs? <laughs> I'm a group product manager, and, and amongst the product journeys that I own is the disaster recovery user journeys, so covering backup, restore, uh, resilience in general as well uh, within the database. So um, nice to meet everyone. And thank, thanks for joining. What other areas do you work on, Michael? Uh, a lot of the core parts of the database. So the file system layer, Pebble, uh -huh. um, as well as the KV layer, which manages distribution, replication, and transactions. Right. Well, an understanding of all that is actually uh, pertinent to everything we're about to talk about today. Uh, and And if anybody's more interested in the KV layer, the storage, how we actually implement transactions, lots of information in our docs. Um, but if you have any questions about it, you know, Michael is on the phone and Chris is pretty smart on this stuff too. So um, Chris, welcome again. Good to see you, buddy. I like the haircut. Um, what, is, uh, what, is, what is your role here at Cockroach Labs? So uh, I'm a solution engineering manager. So what does that mean? So I work a lot with customers on how Cockroach will work for them. We look at the requirements that you might have and then figure out, hey, where does the technology make sense to use us or where, where not? We come up, uh, you know, uh, disaster recovery comes up a lot. We have a lot of customers in the financial services space. So this is always top of mind. So I've been uh, having a lot of discussions with customers around this topic. So happy to be here. Right. So let's just actually, let's just start there before we get into exactly what we built, Michael, let, let me ask you, Chris, I think you, you, you are kind of the surface area to a lot of customers who are doing interesting things with, with Cockroach database, you know, and you mentioned kind of the DR point of view, what, what are the requirements they're seeking when they go out and, you know, they're, they're talking to us about backup and restore. What, what is it they're actually looking to, to accomplish? Yeah, so most of the time, the conversations start out with the RPO and RTO discussion. So what's your recovery yeah. point objective, recovery time objective? It's usually we start there to figure out, hey, what, you know, what are the bounds or your SLAs that you need to be in as far as recovery time? For the most part, Cockroach DB handles you know, um, failover and resiliency just natively within the product, which gives lowers the the amount of technical ownership that you know an IT team needs to handle. So because resiliency is built into the product, you know, there's not much you have to think about as far as the failover processing and so forth. Where backup and recovery really comes into to place actually is really for doing some of the smaller things like migrating data into lower environments, um, making sure I can do point of time restore, things like that. But really the the backup recovery is a is much further down the road in the disaster recovery scenario, just because Cockroach natively handles node outages, you know, right. um, availability zone outages, regional outages, data center outages, it's all handled in the product already, so. Right. So Michael, just kind of working off of that, you know, I think you, you think about this more in like the problems to solve, right? And kind of what are the user journeys that people are using in this? How well aligned is that with kind of the way that you think about the product? Just as, I mean, you're the product owner here, so. I, you know, I love that we have the real world Chris customer and then we have the product guy. No, I think we're pretty well aligned, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely are. I think from uh, thinking about building the most resilient database in the world, right? We're named after cockroaches for a reason. I think part of it is that there, there are, to Chris's point though, that there are lots of different types of outages. Um, we talk yeah. a lot about physical outages, but you know, in talking to customers more commonly Someone runs a rogue query, forgets a where clause, 
someone deploys a bad app, um, someone hacks into your network, the ability to um, you know, pinpoint the data at the time that incident happened and be able to recover to that point or the ability to spin up a new cluster on a different control plane to that where, where this bad actor doesn't have the ability to, to log in and swapping traffic over there. These are all ways to, you really want to have something in your back pocket that allows you to, to a point in time in the past, um, but also to a separate cluster recover uh, for a variety of reasons. Right, and you know, I think about that, Michael, and that's kind of in the, the like a disaster scenario. I mean, there's other requirements too, right? I mean, people are doing backup. I mean, there's, you know, Chris, you talked about FinServe. I mean, these guys have requirements to do nightly backup. So they have basically, they have tape, right? I mean, this is one of those other requirements, right, Michael? For sure. And, you know, like, you know, you can't restore the backup or you can't restore the data without backing it up. And so we have customers running backups on the order of five, 10 minutes uh, incrementally on a regular basis. So we have some customers, you know, depending on, your data loss requirements, we've we've uh, made it such that backup, you can incrementally back it up at a pretty high frequency so that you have, you know, the security in your data. Right, so let's talk a little bit about that, Michael, and kind of what we built, right? I, you know, I think about backups as, you know, there's full backups, there's incremental backups. I think what we're doing is it's distributed. That, that adds a whole layer to this whole thing. Like, and so, can you just like just maybe a quick overview of kind of what it is that we have and you know what what did we build what what do we have in, in place for our customers today yeah absolutely so the idea here is to be able to ship a snapshot of your data off site and to be able to restore it at a consistent timestamp one of the big guarantees that we give right as cockroach db is that we're an acid we're we we're an acid compliant database and so consistency is a very much a strong requirement for a backup and restore as well. Right. So what you can do is you can run the backup command or we, we have a native way to schedule regular backups as well. And what it does is it distributes work across all the nodes and what each of those nodes will do when it's running backup is write a copy of the file as it is on disk out to this third party storage. Um, this could be uh, you know, a network attached file server you have, it could be S3, it could be GCS as well. Um, we support natively the ability to write to a variety of different file storage uh, providers. Does that In include the, Azure storage as well? It does include oh. Azure storage, yes. Yeah, okay, great, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think- uh, go, go on, ahead. go on, sorry. Go, no, go ahead, please do, that's all you. <laughs> No, a few more salient points, I think, is, is where we're storing a single copy of the data. Cockroach itself is replicated within the cluster, but to, to sort of, uh, for recovery purposes, you really just need a single consistent snapshot of that data. And so to mitigate sort of bandwidth and, and, and latency, we store a single copy offsite. But additionally, we check some all that data to, to protect you against corruption as well. And to give you the peace of mind that if you run restore, that data is bit for bit the same as what you backed up. And Michael, when you say the data itself, just let me understand that, you know, you're talking about each node doing the work, right? So we're using the distributed nature of the database itself to accomplish this, right? That's right. Um, each node has its own attached file store, uh, own, fi own attached file system. We aren't taking just a raw copy of the file system. What you're saying is we're taking basically a snapshot of the database. So because each row in, in Cockroach may be written three times, five times, seven, whatever your replication factor is. So how does it actually understand? Is it just the RAF leader? Is that is that what's going on or how, how does it work? Yeah, so we're writing from the lease holder. Um, okay. And, and what it's actually doing is it's say, say you're backing up at timestamp T2. What it's doing is it's scanning the data, pulling the data at T2, writing it into an SST format. So it's the same format as what you're storing on disk but only okay. the capturing the data that you've asked it to capture. And then from the leaseholder, using that as the node to write it out to say S3 or Azure storage. Right, and a leaseholder being, if people aren't aware, if you aren't aware of Raft and the Raft, um, Raft consensus, distributed consensus protocol, go check it out. Um, you know, the leaseholder being kind of the, the master of the replication set, right? Of, 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 of the replica set, right, Michael? And, and that, you know, we're always guaranteed that the leaseholder the, the RAF leader, uh, same kind of thing, 
is always going to be correct. So what you're saying is wherever that raft leader or leaseholder lives, that's where the backup for that particular row happens, Michael. Is that correct? Correct. That's where we export yeah, cool. the data from. Yep. Cool. Awesome. And so we're, we're sending it off to cloud storage, uh, Jesus, Amazon, GC, GCS, S3, whatever you like, right? So then how does restore then work? And, and do we do that in production as well? Yeah, so there are various types. Of, so one of the notes about backup is you can back up at a table level, the database level, or at the cluster level. Huh. And so on restore, what you're doing is you're doing two things. You're specifying what you want to restore and at what timestamp you want to restore. And what this allows you to do, if you've backed up with a specific option, which captures the MVCC revision history, so at a very high level, right? Um, Cockroach itself retains revision history for a given key up to a certain amount of time. If you back up and say, I want to capture that whole revision history, you can restore to any point in time within the captured revision history. So the big benefit there is that, um, is that uh, you know, it, it allows you to be very precise. I think it's down to the microsecond of what data you want, what snapshot of data you want to restore to. And there's a guarantee that the data is consistent across that table or database or cluster that you're restoring at that timestamp. Okay, so wait a second, that's pretty cool. So what you're saying is I can take a point in time, or I could just basically, basically I could take a backup every night at 11. Yeah, whatever that is. Well, I schedule whatever it is. And, but Beck could, I could do a restore from any moment in time down to the microsecond across that, that, that data. Is that what you're saying? I mean, yeah. I would take let's any say, revision. Let's say you take I could take like 7 p.m. and 13 seconds that night. I could say, that's the state I want. That's right. Right. So if you're taking your backup at 11 and say you have uh, 24 or 25 hours of revision history, that goes back to... 10 the day before that. And you can pick any arbitrary timestamp within that time frame to restore to. Right. So what are we doing that's really different here, Michael, from others, right? I, I think it's the MV, it's all in the MVCC, right? So if, if people aren't familiar with multi-version concurrency controls are, uh, again, I think there was another webinar we did, the CAP theorem consistency, I think part one of the CAP theorem stuff. We talked about MVCC, if people want to go check that out. But it really comes down to what we've done there. Is that right, Michael? I mean, that's like, that's kind of the secret here. I mean, cause I mean, you can think about, okay, I could just use timestamps and do this sort of thing, but it's a little bit different what we're doing, right? That's right. And what, you know, how, how a lot of other databases do it is you have to replay logs or capture logs to do that. We already kind of have history ready for us to use. And so for us, it's, it, it's not um, replaying logs, which can take time. It's quite literally saying any slice of data you want, pick that time and we'll restore it just as fast as if you pick 10 minutes prior or 10 minutes uh, after. Right. And it, it, help me out, Michael. Is this, do we use the same method when, say, a node goes down and we have to recycle it back? I mean, is this kind of some of the stuff that we're using the basic same premise here? Not like... Because I think one of the things that people think about when they're recovering data, it's this replay logs, like using the logs to do all this stuff. And like, we mm -hmm. basically kind of eliminated that from this, this part of the world. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it, it, the, the high level analogy for when, when a node goes down and you lose those replicas is something happens called up replication. And what that does is it's quite literally sending snapshots of, of the data that was previously on that node and it sort of up replicates from there, which allows you to then revive, let's call it the same resilience you had before without any manual intervention by the user. This is so cool. I'm sorry, it's just so cool. So let me let me switch it a little bit. Chris, where do people struggle with this? Like where what is it, what is this stuff that people kind of like maybe don't get at first, and then when they get it, they see the power in it. What what are you seeing within customers? Yeah, so a lot of folks think, all right, well, I'm you know, I'm backing up all the data in, in my cluster. Um, you know, I'm 3X copying it and you're not. It's all going down to a single right. copy. A lot of folks think, all right, I have, um, maybe I have a 15 node cluster. Uh, what if I just want to restore that into a three node? Do I have to set up a 15 node cluster uh, again as well? And you don't have to. You can have mixed shape clusters that you restore to as well. Interesting. Yeah, and then there's, a, there's another great story. A lot of times you could just use backup and restore 
for um, not like the major outages, but even smaller or minor ones too. So we had one prospect we were working with. They were using cockroach in production. Um, they, they, ha they have become a customer, which is great. Uh, but one thing they were doing, they weren't taking backups on their production data. And then they had a, um, a rogue application that actually fudged some of the data. And so the, the, um, the, the recovery method that we gave them is like, well, listen, since you, you know, this just happened, take a backup from just the time before that rogue application hit. We took the backup of the data and then restored it into, into the cluster. And they had, you know, they had a, a, a new database that they can work from based on the data that was in the MVCC. So even though you didn't have a backup of the data, we could take a backup while the, you know, going, you know, going back in history to, to make things better again. It's kind of a unique, yeah. um, unique situation for, for them. Well, it's a unique situation, I think, in terms of a database as well, Chris. I think when I first understood like what we were doing, I had this aha moment. And I think that's what, you know, I think that's what people see. I, I, you know, I've, I've talked to people before. It's kind of one of these things is like, once you see cockroach, you can't unsee it sometimes. Um, <laughs> but then again, I live in this place, so I can't unsee it anyway, because I dream about work, but that's a separate story. But I think like just being able to think about this, not as logs, but really what's happening in MVCC and, and the power of distributed systems. And I think, you know, as people build out their own distributed systems, there's a lot more value in a lot of these kind of uh, these, these, the protocols that are used uh, beyond just kind of the obvious. I think this is definitely one of those areas. Like this is one of those things where I just said, wow, this is, that's, that's really, really cool. So um, I, a, a question just came in. I don't know, Chris, you want to take this, you know, is the restore scoped only to the cluster level or can records be selectively restored? Yeah. So uh, Michael kind of hit on this a bit. You can do it at the cluster level, a table level or uh, a database level. I'm sorry, mix those. So cluster database yeah. and table. Uh, yeah. So even if you restore at the table level, you can then go back and look at the records that you needed. So you could restore to another table and then have another process there to figure out what rec specific records that you need. Right, but you can get as granular as you need to do. Yeah, all together, right? Absolutely, and then there's another feature that kind of goes hand in hand with backup and restore, and that's being able to use uh, as of system time queries. These are queries that allow you to read from the MVCC to say, hey, what did the database, what did the database look like or this table look like at a certain timestamp? Um, right. Really helpful as well. They kind of go hand in hand with backup and restore. So, you know, like the, like the question that Tim just answered, asked, uh, what if you want to be very selective about the records? You know, you can always restore a table from a prior time and then use as of system time queries to even go back further through the data to figure out what records, you know, you need or need to audit or look at or refine. And it's, it's a really interesting feature as well, you know, the as of sister time thing. Michael, do you own that as a product feature as well? Is that more of a, that's like a kind of a more of a SQL feature, kind of related, right? Yeah, it's more of a SQL feature, but I think it's really the combination of the revision yeah. history and the ability to back up arbitrary snapshots and restore arbitrary snapshots that gives you a lot of flexibility here. And, and the trade-off that we make and why, why we do table and database restores is it's faster. We don't have to actually go, because we have the checksums on it, we're, 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 we're confident that the data we're restoring is right, as opposed to having to check every single record, that would be a really slow process. And so one of the things that we've optimized for in backup and restore is speed, because we know that speed um, correlates with how much data loss you have and how much you're, how quickly you've recovered. And what's nice about the distributed nature of backup and restore is that um, you, because the way that you grow your cockroach database is scaling horizontally, you're also scaling horizontally the compute available for you to back up. Right. So as your data scales, your backup and restore distributes and scales as well in terms of its performance. Yeah, and I think one of the, the one of, coming back to this as of system time thing, I, it, we, again, this is another one of those things that actually once I figured it out, it was kind of cool. Like, you know, select from a table as of system time is interesting, right? But Michael, I mean, we have built this into restore as well, right? So we can actually define restore as of system time as well. So yeah, Chris, I mean, we'd take a restoration and then do a select to down to the individual table the table level. But there's a lot of power in that in that one command, right, Michael? I mean, we that you can. Yeah. Just, Explicitly Absolutely. set an end time, right? And what, one of the one of the best uses for as of system time queries as well. And I, we're diverging a little from disaster recovery. I know, I know but it's we, important. Because you know? serializable isolation, um, as of system time querying allows you to have slightly stale reads, um, it, along with a feature 
called follower reads without yeah. transaction contention with rights. And so what that allows you to do yeah. is fast reads on slightly stale data without hitting transaction contention. And so it allows you to really craft a, a functionality where you can have fast writes and fast reads with low contention and serializable isolation. Yeah, and I was just gonna say that, the key piece to that is that it's a stale but consistent read, right? Yeah, stale, stale, really, really critical. Consistent. Yep. Stale but consistent, yeah. And I think, you know, it, related but unrelated, Michael, we'll just leave it at that, right? Like it's, you know, I, it, it all kind of comes together. And I think it's one of those things, again, like going back to the, the core principles and the, you know, the core architecture of the database, this is some of the things that allows you to do, right? And so let's shift it a little bit. And I, there is a question here. I'm going to come back to Ajay's question in a, in a second, Chris. Um, but, you know, Michael, we also do encrypted backup and restore as well. Um, so that these things, is that, how is that controlled? Yeah, so th this, so, so there are two aspects of encryption, what, right? One is client-side encryption where we're actually encrypting the data before we send it over the wire. Um, all of our connections are, are TLS encrypted as well. So over the wire, it's encrypted. So our connections to S3, Azure storage, et cetera, are all encrypted as well. And then certain right. customers choose to use encrypted storage as well. But right. in terms of encrypted backups, we're talking about client-side encryption. So um, we currently support AWS KMS um, and the ability to provide a, a plain text encryption key. Um, we have plans on the roadmap in the future to add more uh, sort of um, vaults, let's call it, or, or, or secret stores to, to be able to store, use the encryption key. But what you can do is you can specify, hey, I want to encrypt with this uh, KMS key or with this passphrase. And it, we encrypt the data with it in memory within the database and send that yeah. encrypted over the wire and store it <laughs> encrypted. So that adds a layer of security against, uh, let's say, hackers getting access to your backup files. Right. I think it's kind of one of those core things that you just kind of have to have. I mean, what's the point of encryption if you aren't doing that on your backup as well, which brings me to the next point, which is, you know, we call it locality aware mm -hmm. backup and restore kind of one of these key features of Cockroach that if you're not familiar with our database, you know, our unique ability to tie data to a location for whatever reason that is. One of them is speed, right? Speed of access to data. But one of them is compliance. One of them is, you know, I want, you know, German records to live in Germany. Well, if I did a complete backup of an entire database and stored it in Georgia, not, I guess the country would be the same, same difference. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm now kind of invalidating the, the whole regulatory compliance thing. Right. And so we can actually do backups with, with locality aware backups. Right, Michael? Yeah, that's right. And there's some, there's some uh, sort of nuance to the sort of how we pin the data that could be a separate topic altogether, but at a very yeah, high yeah. level, right? Like it, one of the value propositions of Cockroach DB is that we can globally distribute the data in a single logical cluster. And so let's say you have nodes in the US, nodes in the EU and nodes in APAC, um, rather than storing your backup all in say EU and having to write data from the US and APAC all the way to the EU, we allow something called locality aware backups where you can specify storage uh, options in various locations and you can home in the data that is coming from lower bandwidth costs, lower latency, faster backups. Yeah, it's so cool. Chris, how often are people thinking about this at this point? You know, I mean, it's a pretty advanced topic, right? You kind of got to understand a lot, a fair, a couple of layers, right? I mean, is this a popular concern with, with prospects and customers? Yeah, for multi-region customers, it definitely comes up a, a fair amount, and they love it because you don't have to ship all this, you know, all this data into one location. You can keep it in the locality as is. It saves a lot on, you know, the network costs, the transfer costs. It makes the backups faster. Um, right. So yeah, it's definitely a key feature. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and you know, scheduling all this stuff is important. We have a complete schedule to do all this, as Michael mentioned before. I think it's like, you know, it's funny. We can build a really cool database, but unless it has all the things that people need, like uh, scheduling and administration and management and all this stuff, uh, really, really critical. Michael, is all this done through the UI and CLI? So this is primarily through the, the sort of uh, SQL shell actually today. Um, uh, and we have some CLI tooling and that relates a little to Ajay's question. 
uh, around yeah. sort of more about the sort of inspection uh, of backups, but we, we can get to that in a second. Okay. Well, cool. Um, you know, I, I, I think we covered all the core features that are built in. Michael, what did I miss? I mean, that's, those are the big, that's the big kind of milepost, right? Yeah, I think the, those are the big ones. I think the only one, uh, the other thing to add, two, two more points to add here. Um, if you use our Cockroach Cloud product, we take backups on your uh, app already. And yeah. we allow you to, through the UI, restore through a GUI um, the data in, in case of disaster. Um, so that, that's one of the benefits of using our, our sort of uh, as DB as a service platform is that we handle a lot of that uh, operational overhead for you. I think yeah. the last piece is incremental backups. Um, I think what we find is they're faster, right? Because they're storing less data. And so people are more comfortable running that more often. So they'll have a cadence of a full backup every so often with incremental backups every so often in between that as well. Yeah, I had that air marked in my head to go down that path, and oops, <laughs> I'm gonna blame I'm gonna blame that on two weeks holiday, dude. So, um, <laughs> cool, Michael. Why, what's that, buddy? Valid excuse. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm really happy that just, you moved your camera. You just, now can... you just haven't recovered from your uh, your holiday. That's, oh that's wow, you know. Chris, that is just yeah. horrible. <laughs> I don't even know where to go from that. It's Michael, just... I'm happy you moved. I get seeing mountains out your window now. It's good. So. <laughs> Um, Michael, what's coming, you know, as, as you go up that mountain, uh, roadmap, you know, what, what are you working on today with, from a backup restore front of you? What's, what's cool. Yeah. So in our 21.2 release, which is slated for later this year in November, uh, we're including, uh, a number of, uh, changes that will improve the story here. I think what we're finding is that customers are storing with more data and more frequent backups. And so making sure that backup can keep up with that scale. Um, we also made significant improvements to restore speed um, where in the wild customers tested on their hardware and we we're able to get three to four times speed improvements on restore. That's, you know, that's very important when you're in a disaster and really want to get that data back really quickly. Hold on, I'm sorry, I'm on mute again. You guys, I'm out of practice here. So let's just take, you know, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Michael. And, and look, I'm not looking for an official, like exact benchmark answer here. Uh -huh. Let's say I had a, a database that's about a terabyte in size. It's you know decent size, right? Mm -hmm. How long does that take to back up? I, I guess how long does that take to re I think restore is the question. You know, today versus the you know, improvements that you're looking at for the fall. So the long answer here is that um, we have some folks working on benchmarks that we hope will be uh, available. And, and, and replicatable by customers uh, sort of on demand. But I think at a very high level, you know, it really depends on your compute, right? Because what's really cool about restore is the more nodes you have, the beefier those nodes are, the faster you'll restore. That's right. Um, and so, but you know, at a very high level, we're not talking hours, we're talking uh, yeah. tens of minutes. And I think that's what's important here. It's, it's, this is not like some like heavy, heavy downtime waiting forever, you know, I mean, you're not right. You're right. If I have better compute, I'm better. I think the improvements we're looking for the fall are, you know, they're of like the eight X or seven or 10 X kind of, you're such a good product manager. I love how you just did. You just totally sidestepped my, my very exact, my very exact question. I love it, dude. Yeah. But like, like for real though, like if you're restoring with six nodes versus 12 nodes, we distribute that work. 12 nodes will be yeah. faster than six. And yeah, so that's exactly. one of the levers that we can pull. If you truly care about the RTO, the recovery time objective, um, that's right. how quickly you can recover, one of the options you have is to horizontally scale the cluster you're restoring into to do it faster. Right. I, Chris, I mean, are people doing that? I mean, they restore into a larger environment and then scale back, like pull nodes out of that? I mean, I, that's I, Jesus, I can get up and running really quick, right? And then... I guess go out with 12 and bring it down to nine nodes, right? I mean, that's an option, right? Yeah, so I, I think that's what we've seen. That there's a, been a lot of excitement around that option. In practicality, I don't have too many customers doing that just yet, um, yeah. but there's no reason why you couldn't, right? Just to say, hey, right. let me expand as much as I can to restore as fast as I can um, and then contract when, when I don't need it. Yeah. I, I think it, largely because we don't have a lot of disaster recovery scenarios where we need to do this. I think that's probably the main reason why. Belt, yeah. belt and suspenders, dude. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And you know, one of the- It's true. Yeah. 
You know, I, it's funny, you know, we wrote this, uh, we wrote a piece on kind of high availability and cockroach and, you know, HA for us, it's like a range of five nines. You know what I mean? Like, cause I, it, well, what do you want? You could push up your replication factor. You know, you could have like thousands of nodes. I mean, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of dials and, and levers you can pull here to, to get what you want to accomplish. And I think it really comes back to, I think Chris, people aren't thinking like that because I think it's the operational experience that people have to build within their organization to get really comfortable with this, to understand what all those options are. And I think that's the, you know, it's funny of all the best practices that, that come out of our customer conversations here on public events or even in private, it's building that operational expertise around Cockroach to really start to understand, wait a second, there are some really cool things I can do or there's a different way of doing something I did before. It's maybe more efficient, you know, and I think that's kind of one of those cool things. So, um, so let's, I, there was, there were two questions here. I don't know, Chris, do you want to cover one of these or do you want to ask it or? Yeah, I was just, I was just uh, <laughs> going to answer the second one as well. Um, yeah. So the first one, so Ajay, I just put a, a link in the chat, um, but there's basically a show backup command that. Yeah. So hold on a second, just to repeat the question. So Ajay was asking, so if I lost a complete cluster, if I'd lost a complete cluster, um, and I want to get to, I want to know what, what point in time I could restore to, right, Chris? I mean, that's basically the, the question that we're asking here. You know, mm -hmm. how do I look through the metadata, the backup information outside the cluster? And so, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So you'll have your data if it's an S3. Um, that's fine. What you could do is use a show backup command, and that will show you, hey, what was the timestamp that the, the data was taken from? Um, and if there's incrementals there, incremental backups as well, you'll see each of the timestamps as to when they were taken. So that will give you an idea if there's a point you want to restore from or the, the max timestamp you can restore from. Um, right. That's the best way to do it. It's, it's, it's literally three commands, show backup from and then the location. And that's within the cluster itself. Is there anything you can do outside of a cluster? Oh, that's, yeah. that's actually outside the cluster. It's going to read from the yeah. S3 file system. But Great. Uh, awesome. To, to be very, I think, um, precise here, the backup sits outside the cluster, but the show backup command needs to run on a running cockroach cluster. And we've identified that as a gap on the product side. So upcoming in our 21.2 release is the ability to effectively get the same data as the show backup command, but through a CLI command instead. So what you would do there is you would have the cockroach binary and you could run a command. I, I don't know the exact syntax off the top of my head, but I think it's cockroach debug backup, show or a cockroach show backup and then you point it to the s3 bucket where your backup is and it'll spit that back into your client so what's great about that is uh, to your point Ajay, you don't need a running cluster to be able to do that you can run it from any arbitrary you can run it from your laptop as long as you have the binary and have the ability to touch that uh, file storage and have the right authentication there um, also coming with this set of cli tools is the ability to inspect rows in that backup as well so um, uh, look out for those docu uh, that documentation coming out in our 21.2 documentation that's coming out in our November release. But uh, you'll be able to export uh, either selected rows or whole tables to CSV from what's stored on your backup, even at a very specific point in time within that backup as well. And so that gives you a lot of flexibility to either uh, you know, ETL your data out into a CSV file or the ability to inspect the data on your backup before you restore it. That's cool, Michael. I learn something new every day. <laughs> I, I'm kind of, that's cool. Uh, and, and, and again, I think anybody on the phone who's really interested in that kind of feature and that sort of stuff, I think we'll, we'll issue alpha releases of things and always looking for people to try it, test it out, that sort of stuff. But that's all kind of cool stuff that's coming, right? So, yep. um, Michael, is there anything else you want to comment on and kind of some of the other CLI tools that we have? I mean, we kind of hit on a lot of the stuff in, in a lot of the roadmap too, right? Yeah, we hit a lot of this. I think just, just looking towards the future, right? I think there are a lot of tools we can do uh, with the MVCC history, sort of uh, reverting data or, or being able to capture a copy of that data in a separate table somehow with a, some create table with MVCC timestamp history. These are all things we're exploring. Are, are on the future roadmap. You know, no guarantees right now on timing, typical product manager answer, but I think, um, and then, sorry, Jim, but- um, I, You know, I love it. Yeah, but um, these are things we're constantly thinking about. So if you have disaster recovery scenarios that, um, that, uh, that, that, that you feel like we're not covering well, if there are tools that you think might be help, useful, 
these are things that we're happy for you to reach out, either create a GitHub issue or ping us in the uh, Carter's DB community Slack as well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's a, qu a question just came in. Do we have a CLI tool for backup testing? Not today. So uh, I think one of the things, uh, and um, there are various layers of backup testing. The, the, the true way to know whether your backup will restore is to run restore. But there are other layers in between, right? To check the checksums, to check um, that, there are, uh, that you have all the files available there. We're, we're looking into tools that would allow you to effectively dry run a restore, let's call it, where you could, uh, where you, you would effectively download the files or, or first check the, the, man, the backup metadata to make sure you have all the files there, download the files, check the checksum, and then just return either good or bad based on that. And that would run quite a bit faster than, you know, uh, it would still not be exceedingly fast because you still have to, you know, capture all that data, grab it down and compute the checksums. But it's faster than restore in that you don't actually have to put it onto disk in some distributed right. form. Somewhere. Right. But um, we're, we're looking into the various layers there. And there are lots of, you know, blog posts out there in the world of like layers of checking your backups fidelity. Today, the t only tool we have for that, um, unfortunately, is to run restore, but we're considering improvements to that user story in the future. Yeah, a little bit further than the fall, right? I, you know, I'll be nice to you. I won't <laughs> ask you for a date, but we'll give a general direction. So. So Chris, what else? I mean, is there anything else you feel like, you know, customers are asking about here that, that we should comment on covered at all? Uh, you know, you know, I think we, I think we covered it all. I mean, from it's a rich topic that we got. Yeah. I mean, like I said, there's a lot of uniqueness you can do, not just in the sense of um, taking a backup and restoring it, but other things you might want to do along the way. Um, you know, those, that question yeah. that Tim mentioned, what if I want to look at rows? I think you, like, like we mentioned, we can use backup and restore in combination with as of system time, uh, you know, pushing data down into lower environments. This is another way that you can do it uh, through backup yeah. and restore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't always just think of it as far as disaster recovery. There's other things you can do with backup and restore. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's what seems like a fairly simple topic is, is underneath the covers extremely complex, Michael, and, you know, kudos to the team for, all the work, I mean, not just within the product group, but the, you know, the engineering team and what's been built into this. Again, I, you know, I, there's, it never ceases to amaze me some of the the software engineering that's done um, in, in these types of systems, because I think this is the stuff that's really challenging. Um, like, you know, we talked about this many times. I know Chris, you and I have talked, you know, building something, building an app is hard enough. Building a distributed application is, is a wholly other layer. And I think there's so many different complications but there's a lot of power that comes from that too. There's a lot of optionality and there's a lot of kind of additional ways of thinking about things. And I think that's what, you know, I was happy to do this session, Michael, because I think there's a lot that you can do. It's, it should be exposed. Like there's, it's a lot more than what we simply think of as backup and restore in our, in our, in the, I guess the normal world, the, the non-distributed world. Right. So actually, Jim, you just recalled something for me. So one place where this shines is where folks are using, you know, traditional databases today. And those databases are sharded and you have to coordinate yeah. all the backups of those. Yeah, yeah. Like that is a oh, yeah. massive headache, which Cockroach simplifies uh, to the nth degree because we'll shard the data for you. We'll take all the, the logical backups for you. And there's nothing that you have to coordinate on, on your side as far as how to manage all those backups and shards and all those things. So, hey, Amen. I mean, the, oh God, yeah, the, the, the operational nightmare of backing up a sharded database, it just completely goes away. It just... We talk about this and biggest headache there. Oh, Having yeah. consistency across those shards. Yeah. We hear time and time again that takes days, if not weeks, to get it right. We talk about sharding and manual sharding and sharding again, but just the the operational nightmare that, that goes along with that is just tremendous. And so thanks, Chris. Great point. I I kind of flaked that one too. So I wish we got that one. Thanks, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's really critical. It's not just scale, it has a resilience thing here too. So um oh, yeah we have one new question uh, you, yeah michael you want to take do you want to just restate it and kind of take this one off sure so uh alexander asked the question um do we have plans to improve the aws client for cockroach and that it takes a long time to copy those files um so uh, we actually investigated that 
Um, and the, the primary thing was there was a per file overhead to download from uh, AWS S3, specifically with the SDK that we have integrated into the coverage DB. So the solution there instead, rather than try and make the AWS SDK better, was to write fewer files. And so we actually uh, have a change coming in our upcoming 21.2 release, where previously you could get a lot of really small incremental backups um, you know, on the order of kilobytes. What we now do is we now stream those changes into a file writer. And so as opposed to writing those out as say 115 kilobyte files, we'll only write out the file after it's hit a size threshold. So what that does is it means you're, you're, you're straight up uh, making fewer get requests to AWS S3's uh, APIs. And so that should be the speed up that you're looking for there. Um, but uh, again, reach out to me on the Cockroach DB community Slack if you want. Um, I'm happy to, to discuss any of these topics more there. Cool. Uh, I am just, I just threw that into the chat too. So, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't give kudos and shout outs to our entire documentation team. I think they do a phenomenal job describing all these things. Not that you all don't do a great job. I love you, Michael and Chris, um, but Jesse and team really do a, a, a really good job. I think our docs is just really shines. It's, you know, of all the companies I've worked in, especially open source, they, they're, it's pretty valuable. It's pretty complete. I learn a lot just going through the docs. So I put a link uh, into the Zoom chat um, where you can find this in our docs. It's pretty, just search for backup in our docs, but um, there is a lot of information out there. Um, but, but as Michael said before, if there's any like concern or question or you need, you know, the, the Slack, Jack Slack channel is a really great place to contact us and to, to, to start doing these things. So, um, but if, if, unless any of you have anything else, I'll just, I'll wrap up our session. Anything else, Michael, Chris, before we take off? Um, the well, summer. We'll, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, what's left of it, right? Uh, you know, here in New York, it doesn't even look like summer. It looks like rain and smoke. We're getting smoke from Portland here it's, or from Oregon. It's just across the country. It's nuts. So, so um, but, but, you know, if anybody is looking to try this stuff out again, you know, uh, it, it, I think the easiest way to get started is, just, you know, start a cockroach cloud account, um, you know, cockroach DB, you know, the, the dedicated managed service, uh, you know, these features are there. Like Michael said, there's a UI on top of it there as well. So, um, always a good way to start to look at these sort of things um, and and play with it. Um, so with that, you know, Michael, thank you for doing this. Uh, Chris, thanks for for dialing in. Michael, you're in, I think, Utah, right? Yeah, Park City. That's right. And and Chris, you are where? Like Woodstock or somewhere upstate New York? Yeah, right? I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm generally around New York. Yeah, generally. Generally New York. And I'm New York City. I'm in Brooklyn. And uh, so, but thank you everybody for for dialing in today. Thank you for taking the time um, to, to, to hear us talk about back of our store. Again, if, if there's any other questions, please do engage us in our, in our public Slack channel. Um, you know, we're, we're just on that all the time, uh, and, and happy to talk through any of these things, reach out to any one of us, uh, if you have questions. So, all right, well, guys, thanks again. Yep. Thanks. Take care.